They're the Brits who race to the rescue down under. Multiple patients, critical. Everyday heroes saving lives. Five miles to run. Battling fires. You don't go out now, too late. It can be extremely dangerous. And fighting crime. Put your arm down. Police, open the door. From the big city to the outback. Our policing district is bigger than the whole of the UK. From the bush. He's been crushed between one of those dinga diggers and a ute. To Bondi Beach. The search continues for a British tourist who hasn't been seen since he went for a swim. You never quite know what you're in for or what's going to happen. 332, three, mate, on the head. Very high impact. He's really quite critically injured. Brits on blue lights under blue skies. Today, down under, a medical emergency in the bush turns into a wildfire rescue mission. Let's see if we can put it out, eh? We're doing some ad hoc firefighting at this point. British policeman Kurt comes across some ugly customers in the outback. Lawrence of Arabia. That is the biggest I've ever seen. Are you with us, Lewis? And there's a scramble to rescue a sick baby. He's been unwell for about five days. They're at the upper limit of what they can cope with at this hospital. In Australia's busiest emergency control room, there's a desperate call for help. Okay, right now, is he awake? Okay, is he breathing normally? It comes from a remote wilderness 70 miles west of Sydney. We've got reports from police in the Blue Mountains of a party of three males in their 20s uh, who'd been canyoning yesterday, lost or spatially disorientated overnight. One of them is reportedly a diabetic, so. They're concerned about his welfare and his ability to walk out today. British flying doctor Gillian Adams is preparing for a tricky rescue. I've just got some overnight and outdoor weather gear. So I've got some warm clothes, some sunscreen, a hat, some sunglasses, um, and a cereal bar, just in case we're there for a bit longer than we think. So the, the police helicopter were unable to extricate them or insert anybody to, to check them out. So they've dropped some water into them so at least they won't be dehydrated. But... The distances are always a lot greater in Australia. The weather can be more extreme, so it can be certainly a lot hotter during the day um, and no, can then get the quite the cold during area. the night. Air medical control. Rescue 26, taxis is time. They're heading into one of Australia's most hostile environments. There's a lot more dangerous creatures and critters out there that we need to be aware of. And some of the terrain can be quite um, difficult to access and, and dangerous. After a night lost in deep bush with no medication, the diabetic man could be in real danger. If he'd taken his insulin the day that they set out and then been exerting himself all day and then not had the opportunity to eat any food, and I believe they only had some sweets with them, um, his blood sugars could have become precariously low. That's what we call a hypo or hypoglycemia. At um, 34 degrees. 34. 36 decimal 5. 36 decimal 5. 150 degrees. You get a cascade of symptoms starting with feeling a little bit unwell, maybe a bit lightheaded, a bit shaky, a bit nauseous. Um, and then in extreme circumstances, these people can become comatose and die if this isn't protected and treated appropriately. Satellite navigation helps the team fly straight to three men lost in 7,000 square miles of wilderness. So the decision was for Garth to winch down and do an initial assessment of the boys and the area to decide if, if it was necessary for myself to come down too. on the way down. And you're clear, forward and right, forward and right with five to run. Yeah, forward and right with four to run. But Garth finds himself in a new and more urgent emergency. Yeah, oh. the fire. Let's see if we can put that fire up. A bushfire has yeah. broken out. Unless they're quick, it will spread. We'll do what we can. You might want to set down somewhere. This is going to take a few minutes, I think, if we're going to be successful at all. All right, what do you think? 
Yeah, have to work cut out here pretty quick. Let's see if we can put it out, eh? Ah, oh, thanks. We're doing some ad hoc firefighting at this point. Our decision was to move the helicopter, fly away slightly, whilst the boys and the paramedic on the ground made some attempt to extinguish the fire. Because if you guys come down here again, it's going to whoop it in a big fire. Who'd want to be a fire? It was spreading, yeah. and at this point, Garth made the decision that all four of them needed to be winched back into the helicopter um, because of the unpredictability of how fast and how far that fire was going to spread. Oh, that's really going. Right, I know. No, we're not going to get anywhere. The best to get out of here. Rescuer and casualties are trapped between a wildfire and a steep cliff. Only the chopper can save them. Australia's Red Desert is among the least populated areas on Earth. An empty wilderness that's home only to a hardy community of gold prospectors and a few thousand Aboriginal people. Well, there's our community in the middle of the desert. Police Constable Kurt Whedon, who once patrolled Kent, keeps the peace here, and it's no small task. Vast place, really large. Our policing district would be bigger than the whole of the UK, and you just you just cannot get your head around that concept that sort of a handful of police officers cover an area so big. Kurt's on duty in the police station at Warrakerna, a thousand mile drive from Perth, the nearest city. Hello, Sarge, it's Kurt again. Can you chug us on CAD quickly? Because it's going to be so much quicker. The country policeman's job is a demanding one in Western Australia. Officers are expected to react to emergencies on duty and off. We work a 40 hour week but anything happens after that then uh, whatever time of the day or night is we're the only ones here so we're the only ones for 200 kilometres so it's, it's got to be us that goes to deal with it. So out of bed and uh, we'll be down there and see what happens. And tonight there's trouble in the local town. A domestic incident has got out of hand. By the sound of it, someone's been hit in the head with an axe, but that's the only information we got, so until we get there, we don't know the extent of the damage, so we won't know until we get down to the clinic and find out what's happened. There we go. With so few officers and so many square miles to cover, dealing with any incident like this demands sensitivity and diplomacy. This could be a long night for Kurt. What do you want, a coffee, sugar, Vegemite, toast? The male's been arrested. We've now got him in custody. Hi, mate. Um, we just had a phone call in from the call that they're going to call us at 10.15 and then they'll be ready to proceed with the call and that's all done by way of video links. It's a call room, as you can see, it doubles up as a gym. So this is the, the courtroom. It's all the video link equipment. So there's a dial-in system, dial-in there, the magistrate comes up on the screen and all the cameras that go through to Kalgoorlie. The hearing lasts just five minutes. Right through this way, mate. Have you have a seat in there, mate. The ruling is Kurt's suspect isn't getting bail. Because of the, the, how remote the community is and how small the community is, there's nowhere safe for him to, to go for the community's concern for their welfare because of his behaviour and they believe that he, he may continue to be violent towards members of the community and also for his welfare because there's a possibility of retributions for the alleged um, assaults. So because the community being so small and so remote, there's nowhere safe for him to go. So really the only option and the safest option for everybody is for, for him to be flown and taken away from the community and, and, and residing uh, in custody in Kalgoorlie until his, his hearing comes up. And what we have to do is we have to get them to Warburton. So generally we'll do a halfway meet with our colleagues from Warburton. You put your flip flops on. Good man. Jump in there for us. Ready? Straight in. Here we get. 
Excellent. Mind your feet. The journey their prisoner is starting out on is equivalent to travelling from Land's End to John O'Groats, ending in a cell. High in the Blue Mountains, three lost walkers are in trouble. Let's get in up, guys. Let's stop what you can. And if we bring them in again, we just turn to a wall blaze and fire. Trapped between a bushfire and a sheer cliff, their lives are in the hands of air ambulance winchman Garth Thompson. We'll put you in a seat. When you look at the helicopter, you'll go on the door. You go into a seat opposite at the rear, OK? There we go, yeah. Yeah, we'll put you in a seatbelt. It's the downwash is a big issue. Yeah, so get around there. Just keep in mind the fire. Oh, you have to wait for it, don't you? Put it on. Watch it out. Watch it. Get your feet back and left it back and left three. Put it on. Back and left two. And as required there, mate, if you're happy. Pleasure, my reference. Pleasure. Is it you're coming in nice with that swing, that swing? Control check. Okay, continuing. Watch it there. So this job quickly turned from a potential medical emergency into more of a rescue situation, which is a huge team effort from the crew and the pilot, and as well as the paramedic. OK, Zitzi's at the door. Just going to transmit for a second, Mark. Great you right. continue doing what you need to do. Zitzi's coming to the cabin. I'll shut up for you. Order for 23, 23, 23. Just get on your uh, radar, he's off. As the boys were brought individually into the helicopter, after a rapid assessment, it became clear they were all quite well. We got the thumbs up, because talking is always difficult with the communications and, and the helmets and things. I think they were just relieved to, to be removed from that fire and that area and off to safety. We were low on fuel, so the pilot decided to land on a nearby property and drop the boys off. It's been a very lucky escape. The fires burn for nine days before they're finally put out by bush firefighters. The casualties, Shane Timmermans and Thomas Kotzer, know they owe their lives to the air ambulance team. Absolute gods. So the people who came to rec rescue us, the air ambulance, very professional. They got the job done really quickly. Shane was the final one to come out, and by the time Shane had got lifted out, the chopper was starting to get fairly full of smoke. Obviously, if we were there for a little bit longer, like waiting, um, and say there wasn't a chopper there to like lift us straight out, it would be quite scary as there was a fire, like bushfire right next to us. It just goes to show that sometimes the information you're given initially is not reflective of the job you end up doing. We thought this case would be a simple rescue of a diabetic patient and it turned into a bushfire rescue, so uh, we never know what's going to happen. The British flying doctors work hard and play hard. A few days after the rescue and Dr Gillian is unwinding with her friends in a Sydney swimming club. Certainly work can be stressful, the hours can be long, some of the cases can be quite difficult and you're winching onto cliffs in the mountains, um, you can be rescuing people out of the water. The lifestyle in England is great on a good day, but in Australia we have lots more good days, I guess, so there's a lot more opportunity to get out and about. After nine years and two children born in Australia, she has no plans to return to the NHS. We um, fancied a bit of a change after training and working for a few years in Birmingham. Um, looked around for some jobs. I got offered a job at Manly Hospital. It looked like a nice place to be. So we came over thinking we'd be here for about a year. And yeah, nine and a half years later, we're still living in Manly and our family is still wondering when we're coming home. <laughs> WS FM 101.7. Hello there, it's Jones in What a nice looking day, mostly sunny, 25 degrees in the city, 30 in the west, it is 7.23. When it comes to health, Australia is among the best and the worst places to grow up. In the big cities, healthcare for kids is as good as it gets, but in some remote areas, child death rates are as high as in countries like Sri Lanka or Lebanon. Next coordination journal speaker. It's the NETS team's job to even the odds. So you want the patient to go to ICU, not the emergency department? 
These medics are specially trained to get sick children to specialist care in Sydney as quickly as possible. Are you with us, Lewis? Yes, sir. Excellent. It's the start of another shift for Steve Face, formerly of London's Great Ormond Street Hospital and now a paediatric flight nurse. We've been tasked to uh, Liverpool, which is a hospital about 25 k's from Sydney, to pick up a boy with bronchiolitis. Uh, he's been unwell for about five days. Um, he's been getting a little bit uh, worse, and they're at the upper limit of what they can cope with at this hospital. So we've been asked to go and assess the child and probably move him to uh, one of the children's hospitals in Sydney. Today's case reminds him of his job back home. Bronchiolitis is a lung condition most common in European winters. It leaves its young victims struggling for breath, and it can be fatal. So we can't take him on um, high flow. Yeah. So we can see what his worker breathing is like when we get there, uh, and maybe just trial him turning him down to low flow. The team's patient is in a local hospital in the sprawling Sydney suburbs. We'll need to put him on CPAP. Um, I'll, sit the, I'll set the CPAP up um, either way. So we've got the CPAP if we need it on the way, uh, and maybe just be able to take him on low flow. But yeah, it's worth giving him a suction. The NETS team travels with its own mini intensive care unit. This winter's been unusually chilly for Australia, and there's been a surge in cases like this. Little Yusef Malik is 10 months old. A virus is causing inflammation in the tiny tubes in his lungs. He's been ill for three days, and his doctors are concerned. So initially he was OK. He was just on some low-flow oxygen, but deteriorated in the evening uh, and was put on high-flow. So he went up to 1.5 uh, litres per kilo. And then he didn't really improve initially for about three hours or so. So he was running off 80 to 90. Um, and then it went down to about 60, 70. Despite antibiotics and oxygen therapy, Youssef's showing little sign of improvement. His dad, Irfan, is a GP. How's he looking like now compared to earlier in the night? When we brought him in, it was better, but uh, he deteriorated overnight. So is he looking slightly better than earlier? Or? Slightly better, yes. Yeah. But not and really. Is that since they put this system blowing the air through his nose? It was 68. It didn't really affect us. Yeah. Okay. All right, little man, you're not going to like this. Most bronchiolitis cases are minor and respond quickly to treatment. Youssef's infection is neither. Steve and his colleagues will be keeping a close eye on their patient through the 20 mile journey. So, yeah, guess, can I get you to hold his? Yeah. So, if I can get. Yeah, head and arms would be great. Mm -hmm. All right, mate. There we go. Okay, okay, bye bye. The team's using suction to try and ease the congestion in Youssef's lungs. If we need a ketamine, ketamine. I know it's not nice, is it? We did suction. Usually, these kids they have no uh, nasal blockage, so whenever we are giving flow, it doesn't go down that much, and it doesn't help lungs to expand. So we we have to do really deep suction, and we got some amount of suction uh, secretions, not much, but he, he he will be better with this. Children often deteriorate quickly without warning. And in the back of an ambulance, that can be difficult to deal with. So I'll just get some fluids and bits made up. I've got the CPAP um, bits and pieces if we need to in increase our support. And we're just getting a ketamine infusion made up in case we need to give him some sedation so that he tolerates that. OK. So, Lewis, if you can stick that on the oxygen there for me. That's it. And if you stay close so he knows you're there, and we'll get him. Can you get through there, Lewis? I know I can do it. Such a smooth driver. For Steve and Dr. Karchney, the journey through the Sydney Jams will be every bit as challenging as many of their longer transfers by air. In the big city traffic, specialist help is just as far away if something goes wrong. 
Head base, Casatina, right now, Liverpool. 727, Casatina. Sydney Children's Hospital is a welcome sight for the team. It's Australia's Great Ormond Street, and Youssef will soon be in the best possible hands. His condition slowly improves, and a week after his emergency transfer, he goes home with his relieved mum and dad. In Western Australia, British Constable Kurt Whedon and his Aussie Sergeant, James Parker, are on a two-hour drive through the outback to meet colleagues from the next station, just so their prisoner can reach a jail cell. So from here to Warburg on this dirt track road, you can see that's about two and a half hours drive. Uh, then if we put on the plane to Kalgoorlie, which is about, what, about an hour and a half? Yeah, about an hour and a half on the plane then. Uh, on a busy week, if we're travelling between the communities, uh, it wouldn't be unusual for us to do a thousand kilometres in a week. Distances here are huge compared with Kurt's old beat back in Kent. The longest we'd have to travel there would be kind of Dartford to Swanley, which is probably a 15 minute journey. The majority of the jobs would be maximum of five miles away. Fellow officers from the station at Warburton are a welcome sight. How you going, you alright? How you doing, mate? How you doing? Oh, sorry. Kurt, is it? Yeah, Nathan. Hello, Nathan. Hello, Nathan. Hello, and Stu. Stuart. Oh, Stuart. We'll do the paperwork first when you get yeah. there. Yeah, go on, Stuart. Kurt's not the only Brit out here. One of the prisoner's new escorts is a UK exile too. No, no, there's one I need to keep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Receiving this. Receiving by releasing. Sorry, yeah, sorry. see, I just need this one, yeah. Go, mate. All right, thanks, Stu. Hi, Gene. Right. Right. Cheers. All done. All done. Nice All one. Right. 112 kilometres we've got, and they've got about the same 100, 120. About 120. 120 to go. So, yeah, so got a bit of lunch on the road because I <laughs> don't think we're going to get anything else to eat otherwise. <laughs> Can't miss your dinner. For anyone. Few people or animals are adapted to surviving out here. Temperatures can reach 40 Celsius or more in summer. But there are exceptions. Lawrence of Arabia. Camels were brought to the outback by Victorian engineers laying railways and telegraph wires. Now their descendants run free. <laughs> it's certainly different to being back home. Got a few pictures there. These animals have multiplied so successfully, they're often rounded up and sold to the Middle East. I suppose it makes doing a 12 hour shift a little bit worthwhile when you see something like this. Look at the big one. That one's got to be the daddy. Look at the size of it. Pretty impressive. That is a big, big bunch of camels. That is the biggest I've ever seen. That was a real sight to behold. I didn't even have my own phone, otherwise I would have taken a couple of photos. Even Sir David Attenborough made it love that, <laughs> eh? And here we have the native Australian camels. <laughs> Kurt's souvenir pictures won't be going back home to the UK. For all its isolation, he loves his work out here. And Australia is where he intends to stay. Every year, 5.3 million Aussies take off on internal flights and some will spend five hours in the air without even leaving the country. 
But no one wants Brit Juanita Aleguino as a flight attendant. Four, five, two, and two. She's a nurse caring for sick passengers on the planes that are the ambulances of the outback. Steve, this is Pamela. Hello, Pamela. Hi, Steve. Pamela is 74 and recovering from surgery for cancer. OK, Pamela, going up in the world, you would see over the rooftops of Mascot, that sunrise is gone now. There was a beautiful sunrise earlier. Yeah. Many patients face long journeys for complex surgery in Australia, and Juanita and her colleagues fly more than a 1,000 home each year. Thanks, Steve. There we go. Glad to be going home, yeah? You're looking well. You're feeling well now. Yeah, apart from the, about the week post-op and the painkillers were making me feel a bit easy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I thought we might be well the whole time. 180 right, Golf eastbound then Charlie. I want you at Charlie, cross runway 07. There'll be no refreshments on this flight. Juanita's duties include monitoring Pamela's condition. Some patients require oxygen or extra painkillers. It's been quite serious. She's admitted in June, and uh, she's she's got extensive um, cancer in her bowel, and it's spread to her kidneys and her um, ovaries and her uterus. So she's had all of that removed. She's a 74-year-old lady, so it's a big operation for a little old lady. But she's coping very well. I've just spoken to her. She's comfortable. She's happy that she's had the surgery, and she's coping remarkably well. This is a short flight by Aussie standards. We're coming from Metropolitan Sydney here, and we're coming all the way down the south coast through Wongong, through Ulladulla, and all the way down to Marimbula here, which you're looking at six or seven hours by road. And we're just going to nip straight down there in 40 minutes. I'm just keeping an eye on her saturations, just to make sure that she doesn't deoxygenate with the altitude changes. I also um, just check her blood pressure, make sure that she's um, not affected too much by the G-force, and I'm checking her pulse. 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. I think we're on, on two and three. Absolutely, on terra firma. Pamela's on her way to a local hospital, where she'll continue her recovery before eventually being allowed home. OK, Pamela, just moving you. It's great, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you can always travel by this way now. You never have to climb those stairs again. <laughs> that was pretty good. It's a beautiful aircraft. It's been part of a, a life-changing journey. She's been really fit and well. She's had a good recovery. Um, she was fine during the flight and her observations are just normal. And she's done very well. She didn't require oxygen during the flight. And uh, she's coming home to beautiful Bega. And I might see you when I'm visiting. I've got friends down here. That's why I know it's a long way to drive down. <laughs> see ya. Juanita rarely sees her patients again. But Pamela might just be an exception.